Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the Divine Service. Last week I was foolish and thought we could get through the whole Divine Service. Today, let's see if we can get through the service of the word, just the middle chunk. <laughs> we'll keep our expectations a bit more reasonable. Um, I do have something as well. I have, I put together a little pamphlet. This has it, not every single scripture reference to every portion of the divine service, but as many as I could piece together over the last week. Um, so this is not exhaustive, but it does, it's broken up by the different sections of the liturgy and it contains as many Bible verses or references that I could fit in. So some, exactly, yeah. I, I did not have time to print out extra copies before Bible class, so if you would like one right now, stick around. Otherwise, I'll have more copies next week too. So, um, but there's passages that, are, that we quote in the liturgy word for word, but then there's also passages uh, that inspire the parts of the liturgy where it's not a direct quote, but um, it's the concept that we take from scripture. And so we, you can get an idea of not only the words we say where they're written in scripture, but also why we have these certain parts of the liturgy when we do and what's inspiring the divine service in that regard. So um, I will have my copy as we go along today, but if you'd like one right away, I can print one off for you after class. Um, otherwise, I'll have more available next week, next Wednesday. So, but before we get into the word, why don't we join together and ask the Lord's blessings in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God made flesh, we thank you for this time that has been given us to study your word, and in particular, how your word has been woven into this beautiful tapestry of the divine service for our blessing, for our benefit, for the forgiveness of our sins and the strengthening of our faith. We pray that as we examine this divine service that the church has uh, crafted over many hundreds of years, that your word within it would bless us and strengthen our faith and trust in you and our love for each other. We pray all these things to the glory of your saving name. Amen. All right, so we went through... Uh, the, the first part of the three parts. The first part is the service of preparation. Confession and absolution, we are prepared to personally meet our Lord in word and sacrament. Um, and so we have the, uh, the confession, and, uh, confession of sins and absolution. Um, Gloria Patri, glory to the Father. The Lord have mercy, where we ask God's mercy for everything we need to keep this body in life, everything we need to lead a God-pleasing life. And then we give glory to God in the, the song of the angels, glory in excelsis Deo, uh, where we also see the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Then it's the salutation where I say the Lord be with you like the resurrected Christ, actually present with his disciples. And the congregation responds, and with your spirit. Why is and with your spirit better than, and also with you. Yes, yeah, yep. Yeah. So it's not a personal blessing for me, uh, Pastor Jacob Kempfert. It is the congregation's blessing of the ministry, the office of the pastor, right? Um, and so, yeah, that is what uh, Paul says to Timothy, the Lord be with your spirit. That is, be, be with you in this divine vocation uh, as the, the servant and shepherd of God's people. Uh, all right, and then we have the collect, the prayer that sort of summarizes all of the themes that we will be hearing in the word of God. And that brings up, oh, one other point. I don't think I mentioned. I talked a bit about some of the motions that I do at the altar and the meaning behind it. I don't think I talked about what I do during the confession of sins. Um, which is when we confess our sins, O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, I put both my hands onto the altar. You might notice that. Uh, and that's because we are placing all of our sins onto the altar of God, where the, uh, that that's, represents the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle and temple. Uh, where God was truly present with his people. That was where the Day of Atonement sacrifice was made. The blood was sprinkled on the lid of the, Ar of the Ark of the Covenant, which is called the mercy seat of God. That is where God sits down in his mercy with his people for the 
atonement of their sins, their forgiveness. So I, as the representative of the congregation uh, and for my own sins as well, I place my hands on the altar and I confer them to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As a, yeah, as a, at the beginning it does, but then it's such a relief as well um, that, uh, yeah, he takes them and he, he's already paid for them in full. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a physical motion that, that reveals a divine truth, that teaches us divine truth, that these sins are taken away from us and placed onto Jesus and put to death, paid for in full. It is finished. And so I, I say that, um, but I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. I don't want them anymore. I don't want to do them anymore. I put them on you, uh, Lamb of God. And I pray you of your boundless mercy. And here I uh, lift my hands up, receiving the mercy of God uh, on my own behalf, because I desperately need it, but also on behalf of the congregation as well as the representative and shepherd. And so I... Uh, I, of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved son, looking to that cross right above us, uh, I receive the cross of Christ, the suffering and death of Jesus that paid for the sins of the world. Um, so I, I think I, I didn't mention those hand gestures, but you might see me make those in the liturgy and they have that specific meaning and intent behind them. I think I saw a hand, yeah. Little a column A, little a column B. Yeah. <laughs> um, this confession of sins is something I, I just thought of uh, and sort of implemented on my own. Um, but it, it goes back to everything that we do in the service has meaning and purpose. And so how can I best communicate that meaning uh, while we're, going, we're all going through the divine service together? Uh, and so then I thought um, just the, the scriptural basis for putting the sins onto the Ark of the Covenant, onto the altar of God, the mercy seat of God. And then also we have um, a few portions in scripture where people run into the temple and they, they hold on to the horns of the altar at the four corners were horns where the sacrifice would be tied. And so they would cling to the horns of the altar, basically claiming sanctuary. Uh, protection, safety, uh, refuge. And so the, there's that idea as well. We go to the altar of God for refuge, uh, for peace, for comfort and assurance that our Lord will not turn us away. Um, yeah, so it, it, some of this is, we went through the uh, all of the rites and we were taught, you know, how we should minister to God's people in them. Uh, but then something like that is just sort of a an addition that, I, I guess I'm kind of rogue and I <laughs> started doing it on my own. But um, the key is it, to have scriptural meaning and, and to reveal divine truth and not to be extravagant, not to distract from what's going on, which is also possible when you consider how you're moving around and the gestures you're doing as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, yep. Um, yeah, so a lot of the way that you, that you do the divine service is um, we, we don't have a command from God to do it in a certain way. Um, it has developed over hundreds of years, and it all is based in God's word. Um, but we have this, uh, you, maybe you've heard, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Do you know that's talking about the church? Uh, it, no, it's not. No, it's St. Ambrose. <laughs> I don't think so, no. Oh, okay. It's St. Ambrose. Um, St. Ambrose uh, was a bishop of Milan, and uh, I think it's Augustine, his student. Uh, St. Augustine was brought into the Christian church by Ambrose, and uh, he had a question about when we're in Milan, we do it this way. When we go to Rome, those Christians do it a different way, and Ambrose's advice, well, you know, in the divine service, uh, Ambrose's advice was, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. That is, whatever congregation you're in, do it the way they do it. Yep. So, yeah. And uh, having, um, so yeah, that's a little uh, bit of information is that it's actually talking about the Christians, the Christian church in Rome conducting the divine service. Uh, not just like when in Rome party like the Romans do, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's not what it's talking about at all. <laughs>
Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. That that's what's important about it. Absolutely. Yep. You know, it's, it's kind of funny because you say that because Lyle and I, when we were traveling, we was in, we was in Wisconsin church and mm -hmm. we took a meeting. And mm -hmm. They go to the altar, they all get the cup, the individual cups, but they drink them together at the end. Oh, yeah. And yep. So Lyle and I get our cup. You know, <laughs> I could have thrown out. <laughs> yeah. Um, Communion, especially every congregation has their way of doing it, and uh, it's it's always a little when you're in a new congregation. Uh, I'm always sitting there like, <laughs> okay, all right, we go up, and then we okay, we split off in two directions, okay, and then we you know you, you got to watch the people ahead of you to figure out how you know what to do they, when. They don't work with the set in front row. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe that's why Lutherans never sit in the front row. I don't know. <laughs> They're waiting for everybody else, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no, you go ahead. You go first. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So, yeah, that brings us to the service of the word, page 67. Uh, so having prayed the collect, the summary of the ideas and themes that we're about to hear about and meditate on, we have the um, Old Testament lesson first. Um, and so this, this was a, a long tradition in the Christian church to have a reading from the Old Testament, a reading from the New Testament, and then a reading from one of the Gospels. And really, it, it, the Christian church started their services in Acts um, focused on the Gospel, uh, what, what Christ Jesus did for us. And it was the eyewitness testimony of the apostles themselves speaking to the local congregation that then led to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John being recorded, written down um, by their specific authors. So we start with the Old Testament. We see how uh, believers, Messianic believers, uh, the people of Israel, foreshadowed and looked forward to Jesus, the Messiah. They had the word of prophecy that would then become flesh in the Messiah. We have uh, examples of this in the Old Testament itself. Uh, in 2 Kings 22, the law of Moses had been forgotten. They didn't have, they, they forgot where they put it. Uh, they, they didn't have a copy of the scrolls of the law. They had it, but they didn't know where it was because there were so many bad kings that just didn't care about it. Um, it sort of got, you know, uh, pushed aside. And then they, they were rummaging around the basement one day and they pulled out this box and they opened it up and they said, it's the law of Moses. <laughs> Uh, there was um, under, um, uh, let's see, who is it? King Josiah, I think, uh, one of the, the prophets, finds the scrolls of the law of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and brings it to Josiah, who was a, a good king. And he says, I found the law of Moses. <laughs> so they gather all the people together and they read from the law. They read from the old covenant. And the people... Uh, are, are in despair because they hear all of these laws of God that they have not fulfilled. They've committed idolatry. They've sinned against God and against their neighbor. So they're filled with despair. But then the prophets of God proclaim uh, God's mercy and forgiveness. So we have a reading of God's word that points out sin, that produces repentance, and then the comfort and assurance of God's mercy proclaimed to the people. Jesus himself does this. Uh, in Luke chapter 4, we have Jesus in the synagogue, and he reads from Isaiah chapter 61, uh, and then he explains it to the people. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, in Jesus himself. So we have the example of reading from God's word and then explaining it to God's people. In Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah, those books have to do with rebuilding Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple after they were destroyed by the Babylonians. And so as they are rebuilding the temple, they read from the, the law of Moses. And once again, uh, it, it convicts people of their sin, but then the prophets explain the word of God to comfort people and to proclaim forgiveness and God's mercy. Uh, all right, so then we have the gradual psalm, uh, an anthem or hymn. Some churches put the psalm of the day here at this point. When we have special music, we put it at this point as well. Um, and here we have um, 
Ephesians chapter 5, uh, be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and Psalm 89, I will sing of this steadfast love of the Lord forever. We have this, the, the receiving the word of God is connected to music, making music. Uh, in our heart, but also with our voices and with instruments as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> um, yeah. So then we read from the New Testament from an epistle. One of that's the letters. Epistle just means a letter. And so we we read from. Most commonly, it's from Paul because Paul wrote most of the New Testament. But we also we've been going through the book of James lately. The letter of James. We have two letters from Peter. We have three letters from John and then also his revelation. So this next Sunday, we're going to hear the epistle from Revelation because that was written, as we saw this summer, it was written as a letter to these seven congregations. So it, it's, it counts as a letter, as an epistle. It's also what we call apocalyptic, which means it, it has to do with Christ's return, the revelation of Christ's return to us as well. Uh, but we read from the epistles because Acts 2, 42 gives us the early Christian church, they said, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. So we have from uh, shortly after Christ's ascension into heaven, the church meeting together, hearing from the apostles, the teaching of the apostles. This is what we still do in the epistle lesson, the apostles still speak to us and teach us in fellowship with one another. Um, in Ephesians 4, it's written, And he, God, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So we hear from the, uh, the apostles uh, and prophets in the Old Testament, evangelists in the Gospels to equip the saints, uh, the saints of God in the body of Christ. Um, we also have 2 Timothy 3, scripture is breathed out by God, inspired by God, and it has a purpose. It has multiple purposes for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness. So we read the teaching of the apostles, which is the teaching of Christ, for these purposes. Right, So the epistle lesson is there from very early on to accomplish these things. Um, also, interesting point, uh, Paul's letters were considered holy scripture inspired by God, even in Paul's own day, Paul's own time. Peter, this is an important passage to remember for apologetics purposes. Peter, in 2 Peter 3.16, calls the letters of Paul scripture. He's putting them on par with Moses and the prophets in the Old Testament and the Psalms. So even in that generation, it wasn't that they developed over decades and then later on, hundreds of years later, the church decided what would be scripture and what wouldn't be. Uh, from that very generation, they recognized this as holy scripture on par with the Old Testament as well. Uh, and he says, Peter says, uh, the writings of Paul are difficult to understand. Uh, and so enemies of the church will twist them to their own understanding as they do the other scriptures. So he's saying Paul's letters, Paul's writings are the scriptures as well. But he's also saying they can be a little hard to understand, uh, which, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that too at, at certain points. Um, however, when we, that doesn't mean that scripture itself is, not understandable because we can use the clear portions of scripture to help us interpret and understand. And we also have these examples uh, of the church reading the word of God and then teachers explaining it so the people can understand it. Um, so those who are called to be uh, apostles, shepherds, teachers, explain the word of God so that when it, it doesn't quite make sense right away, we have teachers trained in scripture that can explain it in a way we can understand it, right? Um, all right, then we, uh, we as a congregation have 
started putting the children's message here after the epistle reading. Um, and this is the most recent addition to the liturgy of the divine service, the adding in a, a children's message aimed at uh, preaching to the children very clearly. Often I try to use a visual as much as I can, uh, an object lesson. Um, but this does have a scriptural basis all the way back in Deuteronomy 6. God says, you shall teach my words diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your home and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. So making a special concerted effort to teach the children. Um, Jesus says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. In receiving the children and teaching them the word of Jesus, we are receiving Jesus, God the Son, and God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit in the word that we teach. Um, he says, uh, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. So we have this uh, precedent from Jesus himself that this is an important thing we should do for the children of our congregation. Uh, after that, or on a communion Sunday when we don't have the children's lesson, we sing the Alleluia. Does anyone know what Alleluia means? Close, very close. <laughs> uh, it, what's that? Praise. Praise, yeah. Praise uh, the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yep. Um, Hallelu is a, that's a Hebrew word. You knew a Hebrew word, and you didn't even know it, right? Uh, he, Hebrew word hallelu means all y'all praise. It's a plural for everyone here, praise. Yah is short for Yahweh, the, the divine name, right? So all y'all praise the Lord. Um, Alleluia. Why do we sing it three times? Yeah, the Trinity, absolutely. Yep. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Uh, we, we see this word being sung throughout the Old Testament. Uh, psalm after psalm after psalm uses this, praise the Lord, alleluia. We were talking about Psalm 150. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. We hear it in the New Testament in Revelation chapter 19. We see it repeated. The church sings, alleluia, 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 praise the Lord. Um, why do, we, why do we rise at this point when we sing Alleluia? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep, because the gospel reading is coming up. We show honor towards God by changing our body position. We show reverence and awe by standing up. Um, I think last time I used the example of in, in old days when a lady entered the room, all the gentlemen would stand up to show respect. Uh, it's a similar thing going on, right? We stand up, we rise to show respect for someone. And it, in particular, this one is Jesus Christ himself. Um, we, we read the Gospels because it is the life of our Lord. It is not just a historic description of the events of our Lord's life. It is the very life of Jesus. As the word of God, the inspired word of God, it is the Christ's own life given to us. We have uh, something similar from Peter in John 6, who says uh, a bunch of people leave Jesus because they're offended by his teaching. And Jesus says um, will you, to his 12, will you, also, uh, will you also abandon me and leave? And Peter replies, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where else are we going to go? Christ is eternal life. And that, so we rise for the life of our Lord, not only to show honor and reverence for the life of Jesus, but to receive the very life of Jesus in the word. Um, and so, yeah, we read the gospel, the good news. Uh, oh, one, taking one step back, we sing Alleluia most of the church year. When don't we sing Alleluia? During Lent, yeah, why is that? Yeah. 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 So as we said, Alleluia. Yeah, Alleluia means praise the Lord. It's a a happy, uh, you know, joyous expression. In the season of Lent, 
uh, it's a more somber, meditative, uh, more subdued, because we are... Mm -hmm. Exactly. Ash, we kick it off with Ash Wednesday, right? Um, yeah, which is, we, we are but dust and ashes, and we mourn over our sins and repentance. Um, and so, yeah, it is a, a penitential season, less joyous, because the joy is coming in the Easter season. And we, we are reflecting on the sufferings and, and passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so there we sing, Christ has humbled himself and become obedient to the, unto death, even death on the cross. That is Philippians 2, verse 8. Christ has humbled himself. Um, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. And he humbled himself, uh, going even to death, but not just death, the most shameful death reserved only for the worst criminals and slaves, right? That, that takes humbling and humility. So we sing that during Lent, the, the more reflective, somber season where we think about Christ's passion. Uh, all right, so we, we, say, we stand for the gospel. Jesus says, my words are spirit and life. We once again see we receive life itself from Jesus. And John, in John chapter 20, we see these words are written that you may believe and that by believing you may have life in his name. We hear the gospel to strengthen our faith. It actively strengthens our faith with God's power so that we have life in the name of Jesus. Um, so we, when we announce the gospel reading, we sing together, glory be to you, O Lord. Um, we see giving glory to God throughout scripture. Very often, Paul will stop in his letters to give glory and praise to God, uh, the Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Um, and then after we hear the gospel reading, we join together in singing, praise be to you, O Christ. Uh, once again, reflecting that, alleluia, praise the Lord that we sang at the beginning, and now we, we address it specifically to Christ, Christ Jesus, the Son of God made flesh, given to us in the gospel, the word. Uh, then after the gospel, after we have received life from our Lord, we remain standing and we profess the creed together. We join together publicly, uniting our voices in what we believe. We make a public expression of our faith. Uh, we, we see this throughout scripture as well. Paul encourages Timothy to make the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So this is what we're doing. I confess, I believe uh, in the presence of many witnesses. Um, Jesus says in Matthew 10, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So we publicly join in the presence of others in acknowledging our Lord Jesus and the work he's done for us. Once again, Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For in the heart one uh, believes and with the mouth one is justified. So faith, the living faith is not just a private thing in our own hearts we publicly profess it with our mouth as well. Um, and then Hebrews 10, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Um, there, there's, there's a popular idea out there that says, uh, whatever you believe is what you believe, that faith is a very personal thing. And so you shouldn't, you know, you can believe whatever you want, just keep it to yourself. We, we, all can, we all have freedom to believe whatever we want. It's a personal, private thing. Don't try to force it on others, right? That's an idea that's out there. But I would say what you believe about God is the most public thing about you. What you believe about God will affect how you act in society, in the culture, how you vote. Uh, it, 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 it is a private thing in the heart, but it impacts you in very public ways, and it impacts your neighbor in very public ways. Uh, for example, if you believe that God demands child sacrifice, uh, that's going to have public 
repercussions in your society, right? Uh, whereas if you believe that God loves the little children and Jesus welcomes them to himself, that will also have a, a deep impact on how you engage in society in, in a public way. Um, so I think it's, it's kind of a very short-sighted and actually foolish thing to think whatever you believe about God, it's your own private thing. Uh, no, it's actually probably the most public, it has the most uh, public ramifications for, for everyone, every individual person. Uh, I think it's just sort of a way to avoid conversations, right? It's a way to, to yeah, to just shut people up, basically. <laughs> um, so we want to publicly profess our faith that we share, that we have fellowship in. Um, we talked about the creeds in Bio Sunday Bible class last year, so I won't go into too much depth, but we have three creeds. Does anyone know what they are? Yes. Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, yeah, Athanasian Creed. Yeah, that's the good one, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, once a year. Trinity Sunday, we say the Athanasian Creed. Uh, it's, a, it's a very long creed. It's the longest creed, the most detailed, the most repetitive, but it is important that we maintain it, that we keep it, because as soon as we lose it, we, we start to get false teachings about the Trinity and about the persons of the Trinity, right? Um, and so that's why we do, even though it's very long and very repetitive and very detailed, it has to be. And that's why we still say it one Sunday a year. Yeah, great question. Yeah, so Communion Sunday, we say the Nicene Creed. Uh, Non-Communion Sunday, we say the Apostles' Creed. Uh, the Apostles' Creed is what I make my catechism students memorize, uh, although it always does make me happy when they're reciting the Apostles' Creed and they slip in phrases from the Nicene Creed, because it, it tells me they also know the Nicene Creed as well. Um, uh, so non-communion, we say the Apostles' Creed, that was the earliest creed of the church, not written by the apostles, but according to the teaching of the, to preserve the teaching of the apostles. Uh, we, does anyone know why we say the Nicene Creed on communion Sundays? <laughs> no, no, I'm not gonna. <laughs> um, yeah, so you would think, and my catechism students complain about this, why on communion Sundays, when the service is already longer, do we say the longer creed? We should say the shorter creed, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> um, what is different about the Nicene Creed, just at face value, just looking at it here? More detail about what in particular? About Jesus, yeah, the second person of the Trinity. We do get more detail about the Father and the Holy Spirit, but the heart of what's added and what's different is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. That's because by this point, there were some heresies being taught about who Jesus was. So there's this guy named Arius. Ooh, we don't like Arius. He taught that Jesus was not equal with God, the Father. He was created by God, the Father, as the first act of creation. And he takes, uh, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Uh, and God on day one says, let there be light. So he misunderstands that. He, he looks at Jesus being the firstborn of creation in Colossians, and he says, oh, so Jesus was, uh, th so the son of God, the second person of the Trinity, was born, had a beginning. And he misunderstands that he's eternally begotten. He's the, you know, eternal with the Father, um, as we say in the, the Nicene Creed. The only begotten son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds. God of God, light of light, the eternal light, the everlasting God. Very God of very God, begotten, not made. Being of one substance with the Father, not a separate created substance, but the uncreated everlasting substance, right? So you see why these phrases are in there uh, because they have to address these false teachings. If Jesus is created, I'll say, if the son of God is created by the father at some definite point in creation, 
he can't save us because he's not true God, right? So salvation is at stake with what we believe about this. So the church called a council in the city of Nicaea, hence the Nicene Creed. They formulated this creed of this is what we believe and teach and profess about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's expanded on God the Son, and so we say it on Communion Sundays when we receive God the Son in his true body and blood uh, for our forgiveness and salvation. Um, so yeah, that's why we say the longer creed on the longer church service. Um, and that's why we, have, we, are, we are very detailed in what we profess about God the Son in this, in this Nicene Creed. Uh, but he wasn't just true God, he was also true man, right? Incarnate of the Holy Spirit, made man, made human and specifically human male, crucified under Pontius Pilate. Um, yeah, so defending the two person, what we call the two persons uh, of Christ, or sorry, the two natures of Christ, one person, two natures. That, that would get, get me kicked out as a heretic if I... <laughs> It's not two persons, one person. Two natures of Christ, divine nature, human nature, one person uh, in the what we call the personal union in God the Son, Christ Jesus. Um, yeah, so we have different creeds uh, coming along, and then the Athanasian Creed is much longer because, guess what, more heresies, more false teachings uh, sprang up, and so they need to address those very specifically and deliberately. Uh, but yes, we, it's, it's more and more important in these latter days of sore distress that we maintain a public profession of the Christian and apostolic church, uh, that we are joined together in the profession of this faith. Um, so if we, if we change the creed, if we take out the creed, um, Probably not a good idea to do that. And when churches do that, when they change the creed to take out stuff or put stuff in, or, or they just don't say the creed at all, uh, again and again, uh, heresy follows, false teaching follows, uh, and harm and damage to people's faith follows. Um, and so we, yeah, we, we, we join together in fellowship, and this is what... Um, the, the fathers in the church have formulated for our fellowship and for our mutual consolation and benefit in Christ. Um, yeah, so then we get to the chief hymn. Uh, this is the only specifically Lutheran addition to the mass, to the historic mass. This is the only thing that the reformers added in right before the sermon. Um, we call the Lutheran church the singing church. Hymns are a huge part of our heritage. Uh, we call a mighty fortress is our God, the battle hymn of the Reformation, right? It proclaims what we believe, teach, and profess, uh, set to music, rhyming so that we can remember it and we can sing it. When the first two Lutheran, uh, Lutheran martyrs were burned at the stake, what did Martin Luther do? He wrote a hymn about it. And he set it to... Uh, a popular minstrel tune at the time, so that people uh, uh, traveling on the road, people in marketplaces, people in the pubs, would sing it together, telling the story of these Lutheran martyrs. Uh, and that was the first hymn he ever wrote, by the way. Uh, he hadn't written hymns before. He had done music before in the university and written music, but this, so that was the first hymn he wrote. So without those first two Lutheran martyrs, we might not have gotten A Mighty Fortress is Our God or Lord, keep us steadfast in thy word, or these, uh, you know, all those other great Martin Luther hymns. So they added a hymn right before the sermon, because this hymn usually is doctrinal in nature. It's teaching. It's preparing for the specific theme and message that will be explained in the sermon. Um, and it, it prepares us, it joins us together to prepare us to be taught, to receive the word. Um, and we get this from uh, Matthew 26, 30. Jesus and the apostles, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. In the sermon, we preach Christ crucified. So right before we hear and receive Christ crucified, we do what the apostles and Jesus did. We sing a hymn, right? Uh, that's the, the idea behind that. Then the sermon, um, Nehemiah chapter 8. 
the word of God is read and then explained, taught, so that the people can understand it. Um, Luke 4, once again, Jesus reads from Isaiah and then explains it in probably the shortest sermon ever. Uh, today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Um, we're getting out early today. All right. <laughs> Uh, Acts 2, Pentecost, the birth of the Christian church on earth. Peter preaches a sermon based on the word, Old Testament texts uh, from Joel, for example. So that sets the pattern for gatherings in the New Testament church. We take the word and we teach it, we explain it, we preach a sermon on it. Paul says we preach Christ crucified and to Timothy, the young pastor, he says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Uh, so partly it's receiving the word. It's the word Christ is being preached to us. But then also so we can be taught in the Christian faith. We can be prepared to preach the word in season and out of season, to always be prepared to uh, have a defense for the hope that is in us. Um, so part of the, the, the main idea of the sermon is to preach the gospel, to give people comfort in the forgiveness of sins. But then it's also equipping the saints as well uh, in, in their daily lives. After the sermon, I give the blessing, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto everlasting life. That is Philippians 4, verse 7. Stray from Scripture. And then we continue once again straight from Scripture with singing the offertory verse. Um, and so this is from, this whole song, song is from Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me. So this is after we have received the word and the lessons and the sermon. Now we ask God that to, that, that word would go to work by the Holy Spirit. Create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. I love that line. Uh, for lifelong Christians, uh, we can very easily lose the joy of salvation. It can become a habit. It can become, oh, that's just, just what we've always believed and done. Uh, it, can be, it can become dry and lifeless. And so we ask the Spirit to re restore that joy that we have, uh, the joy of the very presence of Christ with us, strengthening us, comforting us, giving us peace. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> What's that? No, not at all. Absolutely not. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, write that down and keep it somewhere. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to put in a little plug right now. Write it down. If you have a hymn or hymns, if you have scripture, if you have your confirmation verse, write it down. Keep it in the family Bible. Keep it somewhere safe. Keep a copy at church. Make a copy of it and give it to me, and I will keep it at church. Uh, do it. Do it. Do it. Please. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. If there's If you have hymns, if you have a, a text for the 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 homily, the funeral homily, especially, write it down. Um, and write down your confirmation verse. I personally, as a pastor, like to incorporate the confirmation verse uh, because it connects you back to your baptism. And in fact, I say the same thing at baptism, at confirmation, and at the funeral. Uh, may God the Father who created this body, may God the Son who by his blood redeemed this body, may God the Holy Spirit who sanctified this body uh, keep you, or at the funeral, keep these remains until the resurrection of the dead and life everlasting. So it ties you all the way back to your baptism, just as Romans 6, if we have died with Christ, we rise with Christ. 
And it's just a beautiful, beautiful bookends to the life of the Christian on earth. Um, yeah, so yeah, uh, uh, have, a, have a plan. Uh, both as w- what you can do as a witness to Christ, even in death, uh, even when you're not present on earth anymore, you can still give a faithful testimony to the forgiveness and love of Jesus. But then also, uh, because uh, um, every single time we have a funeral, the family doesn't know what to do uh, and doesn't have any idea what the, the deceased person wanted because it wasn't written down. Or it was communicated, but they just said it. They said, oh, have this hymn at my funeral. And then the remaining family says, what was that hymn? Yeah. <laughs> they said they wanted a, a specific hymn. What was it? I can't remember it. Um, and so, yeah, as, just as a service to your family who is grieving and, and has difficulty making decisions during that time, uh, write it down. Write it, go home today and write it down um, because we never know, right? We never know. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I can write it ahead of time and then... You can clear it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Car- Carol, uh, I, I don't think you do want to know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's a joke. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to talk about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we all do. We all need Jesus. I'm going to need Jesus. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so we sing the offertory. This is different than the offering. Uh, the offertory is, it, it, it's similar. It's both what we offer to God. Um, this, the offertory is a hymn of praise or thanks that we offer to God. Um, the offering is specifically uh, to, to su- you know, monetarily support the work of the church, right? Um, to keep the lights on, but more importantly, so that the gospel can continue to go out into our community and serve our neighbor and, and ser- serve everyone here, members here, but then also go outward, out unto others, to all nations, right? And Saginaw is our one little corner of all nations. And we so desperately need it in Saginaw. Oh, man. We, Anna keeps an eye on all the shootings. Oh, Lord have mercy. Give us peace. Oof, man. So, yeah, we, we, we don't just keep the lights on with uh, the money we receive. We use that money to go out into our community uh, and to, yeah, support the work of the ministry that Jesus says, go, <laughs> right? Go out. Um, and we have uh, biblical examples of that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. On the first day of every week, which is Sunday, each of you is to set something aside in keeping with his income. So we're not bound to do a specific amount or a specific percentage. We have freedom in the New Testament church. But Paul does say, in keeping with your income, right? So that is something that... Um, uh, we, we want to be a joyful giver to the Lord of what he's given us first, but we should also have good stewardship as well, uh, that in keeping with our income, that we can also provide for the people God has given us to provide for as well. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, it's much better to give $2 joyfully than $2 million because you think it will earn you something or you're out, you think you're obligated to, right? We have that example of the widow's offering where Jesus says her offering, right, is what matters. Uh, so that's what's important is that give what you've decided to give in keeping with your income, not reluctantly, not because you feel you are, are uh, compulsed to but cheerfully, knowing that all that we receive is from God, first and foremost. Uh, Psalm one, and this one is good to, to remember in terms of stewardship too. Psalm 116, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation 
and call on the name of the Lord. So in the New Testament church, we see what, what, what could I possibly give to God uh, for all that he's given to me? I will go receive the cup of salvation in the Lord's Supper in repentance, in humility, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. Um, that's a beautiful thing, the, the offering of yourself uh, and your heart, your whole person to the Lord, confident of his forgiveness and salvation. Uh, all right, and then after the offering, we join together in the prayer of the church. Um, uh, 1 Timothy 2, Paul says, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings uh, be made for all people. And James 5, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So we are urged to join together in prayer for uh, one another, for the needs of, for our life, for our community, for our, our country, uh, for you know, everything around us as well. Um, and we are reminded that our prayer, the prayer of a righteous person, so the prayer of one who has faith, is justified by faith, accomplishes much, has great power while it is working. Um, let's see. So we have, there's a, a form for the prayer of the church here. There's a few others. Uh, 48 and 49 is the prayer of the church in right one. Uh, and it's responsive prayer. We also have uh, page 96 and 97 is the prayer for right three. And I love this right three prayer. Um, in particular, because it, it, at the bottom, if you're on page 96, the, the prayer at the bottom there says, uh, let your blessing rest on seed time and harvest, on commerce and industry, on medicine and science. Sanctify the arts and culture the rest and leisure of your people. It includes uh, that God would bless science, scientific understanding, and the arts as well. Sanctify the arts, because man alive, they need sanctifying today. Wow, do they ever need sanctifying. <laughs> That's why I love that, because we're praying to God that our art, uh, what we produce for the, for, for, uh, uh, edification, entertainment, that even that would be a faithful proclamation of the gospel. Um, yeah, oofta. All too often, we've let this world have the corner on the market of the arts. Uh, when, man, in the historic Christian church, uh, Christianity dominated the arts. <laughs> Just every expression of art was an expression of the word of God, um, beautifully rendered. And then you get, you, you, it's interesting, as soon as society moves away from Christianity, uh, then you start to get into like abstract, destructive art. It's like we can't even figure out what's real anymore. Isn't that fascinating? Huh, there might be something to that. Um, yeah, uh, art for art's sake, not for God's sake <laughs> or for our neighbor's sake, right? Yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah, yep. <laughs> uh, the art is about what you think about the art, some grand theory or philosophy you come up with. It's not about the the craft itself, right? Um, yeah, there's endless examples I could go into of so-called modern art or postmodern art, abstract art that are, uh, you know, if you have a little bit of discernment, you can realize it's incredibly stupid. Uh, <laughs> but yet, all of these people are very well paid to have all these grand theories about it, right? Um, I, and we'll end with this. I, I also want to say... Um, Right to page 71, the prayer of the church also says the litany can be said. 137 to 139. Let's turn to that. The litany. We had Hebrew with Alleluia. Now we're going to have some Greek. All right. 137. It starts. This is uh, an ancient prayer of the Christian church. And if you're ever wondering what you should pray uh, in your time of prayer, what, what, can, what can I pray for? What, you know, how can I find the right words? Bookmark this, dog ear this. 
the litany um, because it covers so much ground and you don't have to worry about what to say. It's just provided for you. And it, it yeah, it, it just covers all these aspects of life, in particular, times of sorrow and struggle. Um, we start with Kyrie eleison. What does that mean? Lord have mercy. Yeah, absolutely. We sing that in the divine service. Kyrie eleison. Lord have mercy upon us. Christe eleison. Christ have mercy. Kyrie eleison. Lord have mercy. Christ hear us. God the Father in heaven, have mercy upon us. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy upon us. God the Holy Ghost, true comforter, have mercy upon us. Be gracious unto us, spare us, help us. From all sin, from all error, from all evil, good Lord, deliver us. Uh, that's a prayer we need uh, in this, these latter days of sore distress. And here, from temptations and assaults of the devil, from sudden and evil death, what... Notice there's a distinction, sudden death and evil death. What would, what would be an evil death? Shooting, that it's a, a, a death caused by sin, certainly. Dr overdose, yeah, evil death. It, uh, generally speaking, yes, because it, 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 there's nuances to this, but... Overall, if it's done in despair, rejecting the gift of life, that would be considered an evil death, yes. Um, there are, there, there are um, if, if you are not in your right mind and not in control of your reason and your abilities, um, we, we trust the Lord's mercy, uh, absolutely. But if it is an intentional rejection of the gift of life. Um, really, evil death... Anybody that doesn't believe? Is anybody that, does, that dies without faith. Um, you, can, you can die of a shooting. You can be shot and die. And if you have faith, that is a good death. That is a good and blessed death. You can die peacefully surrounded by your family without pain, without faith. That is an evil death. You can die very suddenly like that, unexpectedly, violently. However, if you have faith, that's a good and blessed death. If you don't, that's an evil death. So just because it's sudden doesn't make it evil. Just because it's awful and painful doesn't make it evil. Look at Jesus, right? You can't get a worse death than that because he suffered hell before he died. Uh, and yet that is such a truly good and blessed death, right? Um, in the hymn, uh, um, Lenten hymn, Crown of Thorns, what is it? Uh, oh, sacred head now wounded, who dies in faith dies well. I love that line. The truly blessed death is any death with faith in the heart. Um, so spare us from death without faith. Uh, what, a, what a good prayer. I also, I put a plug in for Christians having hymns and scripture selected and written down in advance where people know where it's written down. Um, pray for your own death. Pray for a, a blessed death. Uh, throughout the history of the church, this has been a frequent prayer, and it's only in the 20th century that we've sort of gotten afraid of death and been like, you, we don't want to think about death at all. Um, but then you're unprepared for death when it comes to you. So pray for a blessed death. Um, that's a good thing to pray for and to keep in mind. Uh, from war, bloodshed, sedition, rebellion, storms, natural disaster, calamity by fire and water, from everlasting death, good Lord, deliver... All bases, right? Deliver us from evil. Um, by the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity. By, so the incarnation is conceived by the Holy Spirit, taking on flesh. Your holy nativity, nativity means birth. Uh, your baptism, fasting, temptation, your agony and bloody sweat, your cross and passion, your precious death and burial, your glorious resurrection and ascension, and the coming of the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, help us, good Lord. So we're, we're entrusting ourselves into God's care for the sake of Christ's work done for us. Um, time of tribulation, prosperity. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. At the hour of death and in the day of judgment, help us, good Lord. I love the prayer that we say in our evening services. Abide with us, Lord, for it is toward evening and the day is far spent. Uh, abide with us. Uh, in the hour of, of despair when death shall come, abide with us 
in, in the day of judgment as well. Um, yeah, so you, yeah, we can, you can read through that more on your own, but it also covers, uh, you know, all, give all nations peace and concord. Uh, preserve our country from discord and contention. Direct and defend our government and all in authority. Uh, and to bless and keep all who administer justice. All who travel. Preserve all women in the perils of childbirth. That, oh man, that's a great prayer. <laughs> Strengthen all who are sick. Free all who are innocently imprisoned. Defend and provide for all fatherless children and widows. Have mercy on all people. Uh, there's just so much good stuff in this prayer. If you're ever wondering, what, what should I pray for when I pray? Page 137, the litany. And it's a, a beautiful and ancient prayer of the Christian church. Uh, okay, so we will end it there. Um, we will have our prayer. And then after that, if anyone has any questions or would like to stick around for the, the scriptural basis for our divine service, I'm happy to, to help. So why don't we join together in, in prayer? O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. We pray that this word that we have heard and, and meditated on, this word that, that we hear again and again every Sunday, the word of assurance of forgiveness, of comfort and peace and everlasting salvation, would strengthen the faith that you have placed in our hearts and that it would go with us in our hearts to, to guide our lives, to be the light for our path uh, as we walk amid this world of darkness. We pray this through Christ our Lord, through whom we are more than conquerors. Amen. All right, thank you, everybody. We will talk about the divine service of the Lord's Supper next week.